Welcome back to the Gold Factor Podcast, your guide and gateway to a life of purpose and fulfillment. I'm your host, Bernadette Gold, transformation and high performance coach, here to lead you through another chapter of my audiobook, The Crooked Path to a Charm Life, a clairvoyant medium's journey to embracing her spiritual gifts. Now remember, each episode of season one is a new chapter in the book as we traverse the realms of the seen and the unseen. So let's dive in and continue our adventure together. It's time to think bigger, feel deeply, and act boldly. Chapter 22, Income's Dad, Alco's Hubby. My father overcame and recovered from throat cancer, retired within weeks of dad moving into the house. My marriage ended abruptly. Coincidentally, Stan's permanent residency card was approved just a week earlier. One of my biggest fears was manifested. I was now a single mom of two girls with two different dads. Thankfully, I wasn't alone. New Mexico made it easy to file a non-contested divorce. I prepared all the paperwork and filed it jointly with Stan. Within 24 hours of filing, the divorce was final. With my dad in the house, things weren't complicated. It was easy. He was great at helping around the house and with projects. We each had our own space. The girls and I had our own family room downstairs where the master suite and girls' bedrooms were located. Dad's master bedroom, my office, and guest bedroom, kitchen, and living room were upstairs, allowing a significant bit of space for us to cohabitate. It took a long time for us to all find our groove. Dad had to deal with my style of parenting and keeping house. He also had to learn to trust and have faith in divine providence. Born in the 40s, He never felt secure enough to be self-employed. He believed a steady income could only come from working for a company. My income was never guaranteed. From day to day, I didn't know how much money I would earn. It drove him crazy at first. After several months of watching how I manifested intentionally, he began to relax and trust me. We spent many hours in my office talking about beliefs, life, and God. For the first time in my life, I got to be myself with my dad. Seventeen years living on that property bore many projects, lessons, and blessings. It was the longest I had lived anywhere, let alone on one property. My office became the gathering place in the mornings when the family woke up. As I sat at my desk drinking coffee, Dad would sip his from the recliner. He shared many stories of his childhood during our morning talks. It turns out that Mary, Dad's mother, was a healer and clairvoyant. I learned how she healed people of twisted guts and other ailments using her hands, plants, and herbs. It took 30-some-odd years to find out that my grandmother was a healer and psychic. She died within months of visiting us in California right after I was born. I felt so relieved to know that my spiritual gifts weren't just random. They were inherited. Knowledge of her gifts gave me peace and a feeling of connection. So it was no surprise when she started materializing in visions and various places in the house. One night, Bella, just four years old, came running into my office to say a woman walked right through the wall and the wood-burning stove downstairs. While she was a little scared, she didn't feel threatened. Bella said she was wearing a flowing dress and just walked in instantly knew that it was my grandmother. Bella's spiritual gifts were confirmed, and communication with my grandmother began. She shared many things with me during her visits. I learned a lot from her about our family. She showed up a lot when my dad and I were in disagreements. 
when we were fighting, she was adamant about being good to him and trying to understand him. She also appeared when something was going on in my extended family. In 2009, while I was fighting a second bout of leukemia, naturally, Grandma kept coming around. Initially, I thought she was hanging out because of Dad, but I kept hearing her voice and sensing her energy around me. I mentioned to Dad that I was searching for natural remedies, and his mom kept appearing. I kept seeing in my vision a handwritten recipe book that Grandma kept, full of her natural remedies. I asked Dad about it, and he didn't know who might have it. He remembers her making remedies for people, but wasn't sure who might have it. Grandma assured me that there is a collection of her recipes and notes for healing. Many of Dad's 11 siblings have died. Teresa, one of his sisters, might have had it, but it appeared to be long gone. Dad and I were talking in my office a few days later when suddenly Grandma showed me a white rosary and a prayer cloth. She said, I want you to have these. Pray with them and you will heal. I told Dad what I heard. He remembered a rosary and the prayer cloth was something she wore on her head. We started making calls to Hawaii. After talking to my Uncle Alan and explaining what happened, he said he remembers a purple rosary, but not a white one. His house had flooded, so the boxes containing the items were in storage. He assured me he would look. Within a couple of weeks, I received a package from Hawaii. Inside was a picture of Grandma, two rosaries, and the prayer cloth. One of the rosaries was purple. Dad took that one, and I kept the white one with the prayer cloth. The white rosary looks just like it did in the vision, a perfect gift from the spirit realm. I keep it next to my bed, and when I doubt my abilities, I look at both items and pray a prayer of thankfulness that here and on the other side, I have great angels and spirits watching out for me. It took six months to put the leukemia in remission. I do not doubt that God, my ancestors, angels, and guides were by my side every step of the way. With so many stories to share, the leukemia battles don't hold as much significance to me as the others. Let me share this. It seems that with every spiritual battle I fought, a severe illness seemed to run parallel. After a series of intense spiritual battles involving a close friend, I woke up one morning in May of 2010 to extreme neck pain. I could barely turn my head, and the pain was overwhelming. I went to see the chiropractor, but left disappointed that the pain hadn't lessened. Monday, I was back in the chiropractor's office, desperately wanting relief. After adjusting my neck, he referred me to the hospital to get an MRI. I drove 45 minutes to the hospital, worried about the cost. I didn't have health insurance and knew this wasn't going to be a cheap test. Angels comforted me on the drive, assuring me it would be affordable. I had no choice but to have faith that the money would be there to pay for it. MRI machines are noisy scary machines and not fun for a claustrophobe. As I laid there in the tube, I prayed an affirmative prayer stating, I know I'm being taken care of. As the radiologist technician came to get me off the table, he had a look of grave concern. He spoke firmly saying, I'm not supposed to say anything about the results of your test, but you need to go immediately and get a neck collar. You can get them from Walmart. Put it on and be very careful with your neck. Don't get any chiropractic adjustments. Go home, lay flat, and wait. I can't say anything more than that. Your doctor will call you with the results after the radiologist reviews them and writes his report. 
Shocked and a little scared at the seriousness of his tone and words, I went straight to Walmart to get the neck collar. I called my chiropractor in the parking lot and told him what the technician said, asking if he would please follow up. What the hell is going on, I thought. All I did was go to sleep and wake up. I would have to wait until the following day. Results of the MRI, a CD of the x-rays, and radiologist report were waiting for me at the hospital. My chiropractor briefed me on the seriousness of my condition, referring me to a surgeon ASAP. I had severe disc degeneration, three herniated discs, and an osteophyte, or bone spur, in the shape of an arrow pushing into my spinal cord. It looked like someone had shot an arrow right into my spinal cord. The spiritual battles I fought for others over the years usually left me drained for weeks, but never physically incapacitated. It would take surgery to remove the osteophytes and address the herniated discs. There were no local spine surgeons with experience to address it. Frantic, I went into meditation and prayer, gaining peace of mind enough to look for a solution. Tons of research turned up everything from quacks to neck fusion and approximately $300,000 worth of surgery in the United States. Without insurance, most hospitals couldn't even quote the price for neck surgery. When asked, doctors and hospitals were at a loss on how to calculate self-pay. One doctor in San Francisco suggested I take a second loan on my house to have him remove the herniated discs, allowing the bones to fuse naturally. Craziness. As usual, Spirit led me to a solution I hadn't even considered. I found a blog by a lawyer in the United States. He ventured to India to have disc replacement surgery. His neurosurgeon used to teach at Harvard, but was now teaching in a hospital in Bangalore, India. I contacted the man and began exchanging emails. He gave me the contact number for a company that did medical tourism. Brazil, Germany, and India were doing the disc replacement surgery for 10 years with excellent results, although it wasn't available in the United States. Disc replacement was superior to fusion. As you maintain mobility and flexibility, of the neck. Through a series of contacts with medical tourism advocates, I had a phone consult with the neurosurgeon my new friend used. With the MRI uploaded to the web, the neurosurgeon, Dr. Raja Kumar, read the radiologist's reports and made his recommendation. Disc C6 and 7 was herniated and needed to be replaced with suspicions of damage to disc C5-6. The osteophyte would need to be removed carefully to take the pressure off my spinal cord. It would cost $18,000 for the surgery, a month's stay in a private hospital room, and a week of physical therapy. Dr. Roger Kumar instructed me not to lift anything heavy, quit smoking immediately, and get there as soon as possible. He explained the risks, the possibility of permanent loss of voice, even paralysis from the neck down. If I did nothing, I was sure to be paralyzed as the osteophyte posed an immediate danger to severing my spinal cord. The surgeon would enter through an incision on the front of my neck, clamping the blood vessels and vocal cords to the side during surgery. It sounded gruesome, painful, and frightening, but paralysis sounded worse, especially since I financially supported the family. I prayed for divine providence, needing the money for the surgery, a passport, and a plane ticket. Blessed to have been able to pay all the household bills without dad's help for six years, I needed his financial assistance now. Without hesitation, he dipped into his retirement savings to help. 
I felt so much guilt, but there was no choice. If I didn't have the surgery, I would become a burden. We would lose the house, and everyone, including my dad, would be homeless. I worked, paid the bills, and took care of myself and everyone else throughout all prior illnesses. This time, I would have to learn how to receive help from others, a more significant issue for me than I ever realized. So I took the loan from Dad, and we started a fundraiser to help. I'd be lying if I didn't admit I was scared shitless. Reviewing the risks of the three-level disc replacement was intense. I would be the first three-level replacement. It was common to do one or two disc replacements, but they hadn't done three yet. With intense pain, headaches, and the inability to walk without falling, the risks were well worth it. In a great deal of pain every day, I found a way to be grateful for the surgery, though. I was depressed for a few days, thinking I could end up paralyzed. Working with a medical tourism company based in the U.S., the arrangements were made to travel to India. The process was so overwhelming and a bit discouraging at times. To make matters more stressful, an Air India flight crashed in Mangalore, killing over 150 passengers. I was sad for the passengers and their families, sent prayers out before addressing my fears. I prayed, asking God to let me dream, to give me clarity about the trip. I wondered if maybe I should worry. I woke up with a feeling that everything would be okay. I watched several video testimonials of patients from the U.S. that went to India for the same surgery, using the same doctor. It helped to put my mind at ease as I committed to making the trip. While waiting to leave for India, I saw Onye, a healer friend from California. Onye did a drumming circle in Durango, and it was a divine night. Although I couldn't dance with the drumming, I did get to stand with a group and pray for others. Onye pulled me into the circle for prayer. Suddenly, the pain from the pinched nerves eased up considerably. My tailbone which had been flared up since the whole ordeal started, was relieved as well. I made it through the night on Advil instead of painkillers. The painkillers were killing my memory, not to mention my stomach and liver. I was trying to save them for the long flight to India and only use them when I absolutely couldn't stand it without them. I would make a horrible drug addict. My prayers were relentless to keep my neck stable enough in the collar so I didn't need painkillers. I had just gotten my liver working on its own six months before. I didn't want to give it a reason to shut down again. An IUD with hormones caused that liver issue. Once the IUD was removed, my liver was restored. My poor dad was just as stressed as me. Although stoic as he is, he tried to hide it. Brindy was pretty stressed, too. I've never been away from my girls that long. Three weeks out of the country seemed like an eternity. Bella had her second grade graduation field day amid all of this. I felt so bad that I was out of it and unable to give her attention before departing. Arrangements were made for her to split time with her best friend camping and her dad while I was gone. Brindy was due to receive an award at her high school graduation ceremony. I wanted to be focused on her, but even that was challenging. The day after her graduation, I was scheduled to leave. Unfortunately, the company I used for my emergency visa and passport screwed something up, missing the delivery date. On the phone with the passport company, I missed her speech. Thankfully, I got to see the recorded replay. My pain, primarily centered in my neck, 
shoulders, and arms increased, radiating down my legs. I tripped more than a few times, walking slowly caused by sudden weakness. The headaches became debilitating, and I was getting worried. The doctors told me any new symptoms were a cause for concern. There was nothing I could do but pray. Thursday, June 10, 2010. I arrived in India at 3 a.m. after 30 long hours of travel. Thinking I would be taken to the hotel for five days waiting for surgery, you can imagine my surprise when I was informed that I was going directly to the hospital for surgery. Dr. Rajakumar's schedule changed while I was traveling, and I arrived just in time for surgery. Before 8 a.m., pre-op x-rays, MRI, CT scan, and blood work were completed. Then I briefly met Dr. Rajakumar in person before being wheeled to the operating room. I had surgery at 8.30 a.m. and was in ICU around 4.30 p.m. Dr. Roger Moore said, I might be a little taller because my bones are so small and the discs are larger than my normal size discs. All three discs went in and I did not get fusion, so I was happy. I woke up sometime late afternoon, June 11th, in the ICU in massive pain. As soon as the staff knew I was awake, I complained of a burning in my throat and pain radiating across my neck and shoulders. I heard a man telling me the surgery went well and I had three new discs. Disoriented and barely conscious, I asked for water. Once I became oriented, I could not believe the amount of pain I was in. Taking in my environment, I was a little scared. The ICU reminded me of the operating rooms in the TV show MASH. Unfortunately, it wasn't anything like ICU in the United States. They gave me sips of water and ordered some hot tea to ease my throat. As the day continued, the pain persisted and I could barely move. I went to sleep in the operating room with a single IV and woke up with at least four more. I begged for pain meds, but was told that I already received the limit. Sleep would evade me for the next 12 hours. Finally, I asked for something to help me sleep around 2 a.m. I'm not sure what time I finally got to sleep, but it only lasted a few hours. By 11 a.m. the following morning, they took out my catheter and escorted me to the bathroom. Once able to walk and take care of business, I was transferred back to my room. That afternoon, Dr. Raja Kumar visited before departing for his conference, reviewing the surgery and explaining that my bones were unusually small. Therefore, they had to use an extra drill bit to make extra space for the disc to fit, stretching the length of the surgery. That night, Dr. Ankit, one of the residents, checked in on me and explained the pain med difference from the U.S. to India. He said I was on 650 milligrams DOLA, which is equivalent to Tylenol. Holy hell! No wonder the pain was so bad. In the U.S., you get morphine after major surgery. I was instructed to walk to speed up the healing and recovery time. Again, not something hospitals in the States recommend. Thankfully, I didn't lose my voice, but my throat felt like it had something big stuck in it, and I couldn't clear it. When I woke from surgery, my mouth and throat were dry and burning. The mouth sore caused by the breathing tube wasn't fun either. My throat had a lovely three-inch incision running top to bottom. Both sides of the front of my neck were hard and swollen. Most of my pain was located in the back of my neck, where the new discs were implanted, and in my shoulders. 
the strange leg and foot pain was gone. I started having a cough a few days after the surgery. I thought it was just an innocent little cough from the throat healing, or maybe from my trachea being pushed to the side during surgery. In any case, the cough made me feel like I had a Lego lodged in my throat. Swallowing was an ordeal since the surgery. Informed later that it was caused by the clamp that held everything as they replaced the discs. Well, that little cough created quite a problem because the neck muscles and tissues had not yet healed. The tightness, soreness, and swollen parts of my neck were highly reactive. To make matters worse, it felt like my head was exploding with each cough. Do you remember the movie Scanners? The part where the guy's head explodes? <laughs> well, that's what I imagine it would feel like to him. It was bad. Determined to heal quickly, I walked every day. The staff all said I was doing great and healing ahead of schedule. I would be discharged as soon as Dr. Rajika Moore returned from his medical conference. Dad was due to arrive right before the new discharge date, unfortunately. Our flight to return home wasn't for a couple of weeks. When the coughing started, I told the nurse and doctor. They both felt my head, not a good indicator, and said, No fever. You feel fine. I was on antibiotics to prevent infection. But they don't use thermometers to take your temperature. They don't take your temp here? Weird, I thought. They also have no idea what a heating pad is. So, I made a homemade one from a towel I brought from home, boiled water, and slipped the towel into a Ziploc freezer bag, put another towel over it to protect my skin, and voila, heating pad. It helped a little. I had only been eating porridge while in the hospital. I didn't like the food at all. I don't even know what porridge is. <laughs> I couldn't wait for my dad to arrive. He slipped some summer sausage and laughing cow cheese in his suitcase for me. I don't know if that was allowed, since cows are sacred, but I was looking forward to eating it. You can't imagine how much I wanted a home-cooked meal. A cup of home-brewed chai tea, my shower, tub, my bed, my pillow. The list goes on. Seriously. Just trusting the water was a big deal. I even missed being woken up five times a night by Tank, my active bladder Labrador, and his cohort Moto, Tank's best friend, a rescued cat. At least I was in my room, and the door was only five feet away. I even missed Prince Furby, alpha dog of the house, cockapoo with a Napoleon complex, fighting me for bed space. Most of all, I missed my girls, Bella and Brindy. I missed Bella telling me how she's hungry every 30 minutes. I miss sitting down to eat something Bella says she doesn't want, only to have her decide I had to cook her something else while my meal got cold. I missed Brindy's phone calls telling me she wouldn't be home. The whole adventure brought a greater appreciation of my life. Even though my move to the sticks of Colorado had been an enormous adjustment, I was still in the process of accepting it 10 years later. I was grateful for it. I still miss living in San Diego, miss the beach, the weather, and my friends. Colorado is rugged living all the way around, unless you ski, like drinking, and doing recreational drugs, i.e. meth or a cowboy raising cows. But being in India, I realized just how much I have. The air is so clean back home. The skies are blue. I had land to grow my own food. I was hoping for early discharge, dreaming of good food, and anticipating Dad's arrival. I wish he had escorted me through the entire trip, I would not recommend going out of the country for surgery alone. However, I opted to go alone 
to save money and spare other people the inconvenience of watching our animals and kids. I woke up in the ICU wishing I knew someone. It would have been much easier if Dad was with me, especially in the middle of the night when I couldn't sleep because my pain was that bad. Once discharged, we changed hotels and moved from Bangalore to the rural countryside of Mysore. Upon arrival, I was very sore, had muscle aches, and overall felt horrible. That night, I came down with a fever. We were staying at a beautiful palace called Brindavan Gardens. We went for a walk in the garden, following the advice of the doctors to walk daily. Before even reaching the front of the hotel, I was in terrible shape. My stomach began cramping, and I suddenly had the urge to use the restroom. Unfortunately, I didn't make it to the bathroom on time. Not the prettiest picture. Within an hour, I couldn't sit up. The muscles in my shoulders felt better, but my stomach was a mess. Struggling on the floor in the bathroom with a temperature of 103 to 104 for four days, concerned, Dad called the hotel front desk for a doctor. The local shanty doctor confirmed a diagnosis of dysentery. He prescribed five medications, one for the stomach cramps, an anti-diarrhea pill, an anti-parasite drug, medicine for good bacteria, and finally, one for electrolytes. Finally, the doctor offered me an injection for stomach cramps and pain. I opted to wait for pills. The shanty doctor came back in the morning to make sure the meds were working and gave me a final fit to fly. I hadn't eaten in three days. It seemed to run straight through me. No matter what I would drink, double what I took in. At that point, I was pretty worn out and had broken down more than once. My poor dad had to witness all of this. He felt helpless. He wanted to get me home, and we both felt trapped. I've heard it said that you either love India or you hate it. I do not love it. Recalling all the strange events that led to surgery and even the time spent on the bathroom floor in Mysore, I felt like there was more to clean up in the spiritual realms. The bathroom walls at the hotel were open to the outside air at the top. The entire time I lay on the bathroom floor of the hotel room, unable to walk to the bed, crows stood above me in the bathroom window. Crows are messengers, but sometimes the message predicts death. Dad kept chasing them away, but as soon as he left the bathroom, they returned. He was visibly scared of the ominous sign as the message felt like a warning. Strangely, as soon as the shanty doctor arrived to treat me, the crows left and didn't return. Before leaving for surgery, I shared some private information regarding my condition and trip to India with a fellow psychic. She was very supportive before and after surgery she offered to do a custom essential oil formula for me. We had discussed the unique blends she was mixing for clients and how powerful they were. I was excited to see what Spirit wanted for me. Late in September, I received the email reading detailing the formula, mixing it, buying the oils from a reputable company, and the reason each oil was selected. I immediately went online to purchase my oils. Guardians of the Gate was the name she gave my oil formula. She wrote, Your formulation refers not only to those who guard you, but to you as the guardian, all working towards the same purpose. This custom oil formula was for protection and healing, both of which I needed. Although at the time I received it, I wasn't aware of just how much. Two days before the oils arrived, I found out that the friend I tried to save from involvement with dark arts 
was moving in across the street. It was during the attempts to reason with her that my neck was injured. The newly placed mobile home took up the view from my office window. Having to see her come and go rocked me. I felt she posed a threat on many levels, both spiritually and physically. With that shocking news, I called the psychic and told her how accurate her reading was and how much I needed that oil blend. It's always nice as a psychic to get validation. I was determined to enlist the aid of spirit, the oils, and prayer to get my new neighbor to relocate. When my essential oils arrived, I happily mixed the formula and applied some to my hands. I closed my eyes and inhaled the sweet aroma, instantly feeling a tingling from head to toe. I felt what I could only describe as light around me and through me. My mind was clear and my body felt invigorated. Next, I placed crosses and oil on every window and over every door of my home, praying for protection. Then I went online and bought four pounds of black tourmaline, spreading it around my house and property for further protection. After applying the essential oils to my windows, doors, and various parts of my home, I felt peaceful, calming energy. Moving day for my old friend came on October 1st. I didn't have the usual sinking feeling when I watched from my office window as she unpacked her belongings. Instead, I felt at peace and kept applying my oils to my hands, slowly inhaling their beautiful, sweet aroma. To my utter amazement, my old friend moved within five days of moving in. By day six, she was gone and out of my life for good. Within a few months, The mobile home was removed from my neighbor's lot as if it had never been there. Five, the magical number of change and transformation seemed to always warn me before ushering in significant changes. Five months of physical and spiritual battles had finally concluded. My faith tested to the max. Miracles, solutions, and guidance always seemed to arrive at the perfect time. For many years, I questioned the extreme events and experiences of my life. Finally, I accepted that for each thing I have overcome, there is someone out there I can encourage, knowing I have triumphed over similar issues. So many people are fascinated with psychic gifts without understanding the importance and sometimes the burden of our experience. I've dedicated my life to being of service to God. Many times amid trials, I wondered if God was punishing me. Once the tests were over, I accepted the growth of faith, courage, in awe of the mysteries surrounding us. We have to be open to receiving guidance and answers in ways we aren't even aware of. We're called to surrender, knowing the infinite intelligence called God is real and available when we believe. Thanks for joining me on this episode of the Gold Factor Podcast. Want some free resources? Well, join my Facebook community, a group of heart-centered, ambitious individuals just like you. Just go and visit the link in the description or you can go to facebook.com forward slash groups, the gold factor. And remember, if you're enjoying the book so far, follow the podcast, leave a review. I really appreciate it as we're launching and growing the podcast and share it on social media. All right, I'll see you in the next episode. Have a great day, be blessed and be a blessing.